This is Dr. Bess Miller, and I'm here with Dr. Helene Gale. Today's date is October 18th, 2017, and we are in Atlanta, Georgia at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I am interviewing Dr. Gale as part of the oral history project, The Early Years of AIDS, CDC's Response to a Historic Epidemic. We are here to discuss your experience during the early years of CDC's work on what would become known as AIDS, the Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. Dr. Gale, do I have your permission to interview you and to record this interview? Yes, you do. Helene, you were in the pioneering group at CDC that investigated pediatric AIDS and particularly AIDS in adolescents. You championed CDC's HIV prevention activities in minority populations. You served as the chief of the International Activity Branch in the recently created Division of HIV AIDS Prevention at a time when CDC was dramatically expanding its international presence. And then you went on to become the director of the newly formed National Center for HIV, STD, and TB Prevention. You have continued to provide distinguished leadership in major public health and development settings, including serving as Director of HIV, TB, and Reproductive Health at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and President and CEO of CARE USA. We have a lot to talk about. <laughs> but let's begin with your background. Would you tell me about where you grew up, your early family life, and then where you went to college? So uh, I grew up in Buffalo, New York. Um, I was the third of five children, so I was the middle child. Um, I had two older sisters, two younger brothers. Um, my father had a barber and beauty supply store, so he was a small businessman in Buffalo, New York. And my mother was a social worker. Um, grew up in a family where education was considered to be a high priority and, and and also, I think, not just education, but also the notion of using that education in a way that gave back um, to society. I think my parents felt that uh, contributing and doing something that left the world a little better than when you came on uh, the scene was something very important to do. So, you know, kind of grew up with that notion of um, being of service. And um, I have, uh, all of my siblings went on to college and professional school and professional careers. So uh, it was kind of what was expected of us. Where did you end up going to college? So I went to college. Um, I actually first went to college in a small school outside of Cleveland. I, I graduated from high school a year early, but hadn't planned to. So I kind of came out of college, uh, came out of high school. Um, without a, a clear plan, and I went to a small school called Baldwin Wallace College outside of Cleveland because my sister right before me was there. It was, a, it was kind of an easy application, and I, I went. But when I got there, realized that I wanted to, something perhaps a little bit more challenging and um, was very interested also in being in New York City. I wanted that exposure to a, a larger, bigger uh, city that uh, was more international, um, had more going on. So I looked at schools in New York and ultimately transferred to Barnard College of Columbia University. At that time, if you're a woman, you couldn't go to Columbia College, you went to Barnard. Um, and that, that has changed, but in retrospect, I'm very happy that I ended up at Barnard, a school that focuses on, on women and women's education. And um, you know, I think that having that experience, both the experience of being in New York, but also being at Barnard, played a big role, I think, in um, what helped to shape my thinking about my future. So who or what influenced you to go to medical school? Well, when I went to college, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Um, as I mentioned, I, you know, coming from a family that placed a high priority on academic achievement, but also service, you know, I kind of thought about the two obvious careers, either be a lawyer or be a doctor. Um, and um, I, at that time, I thought a lot about uh, going into law, but then my two sisters took 
law school and law path. So I said, all right, if, if they're going to be lawyers, I'm going to do something else. Um, I was a psychology major. I was, I was really interested in human behavior and, and um, went from sociology to psychology. But ultimately, when I started thinking about a career and realizing that if I wanted to do um, a doctorate in psychology, that's probably about six years. I was at a school where pre-med was, was um, a, um, a very popular major, if you will. Barnard had a really good, strong track record of, of um, pre-med and getting people into medical school. So I started looking around and realizing, well, you know, there's a lot of folks who are going to medical school. That would probably give me more flexibility in a lot of ways. And so I ended up um, taking the pre-med route. And, um, you know, it, again, it wasn't something I had thought of. And back then I thought, you know, you had to have started that from, you know, kindergarten on. And when I looked around and saw so many other people who I realized, you know, I had probably at least as much capability as they did, um, you know, I ended up going into medicine. And where did you go to medical school? So I went to University of Pennsylvania um, and, um, you yeah. So you were willing to work real hard right from the get-go. Yeah. Well, um, you know, I guess I've always been somewhat uh, focused and, and believe that if you um, put the effort in, there's a lot that you can accomplish. I'm probably pretty goal-oriented, and so, um, you know, working hard came along with it. But, I, you know, I've always worked hard and played hard, so, you know, even though I work pretty hard, um, you know, I enjoyed what I was doing. Uh, I always did it in the context of developing friendships. And, um, and so I, I actually in, enjoyed my medical school years, found it a lot of fun, um, you know, always found ways to, to do other things outside, got very involved in community work, extracurricular mm. activities, um, was very involved in student medical um, activities and, and got very involved in the Student National Medical Association, which is uh, was the African American um, student group, kind of the kind of the um, parallel group to the the um, what was the AMSA, the American Students Association. Uh -huh. I got involved in AMSA as well, but got very involved in SNMA and and ultimately became its national president at one point in time. It's also where I met my husband um, 40 years before I married him. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so what came after medical school? You did an internship and residency? Yeah, so one of the things I did while I was in medical school, um, I started thinking about public health and the notion of public health. And, and um, it, I, I, at the time when I was in medical school, we had a course, an obligatory course in, in epidemiology. Um, that was very interesting to me to start hearing about how you take medicine and think about it at a population level. Um, I also happened to go to uh, one of my siblings' graduation, and D.A. Henderson was the speaker. And so I had been thinking about public health and then, you know, heard him speak, and it was one of these things where, wow, you know, this really is something that people do, and it is something that people do that can make a huge contribution. Was he and talking about smallpox eradication? He was talking about the smallpox eradication campaign. And so uh, I had a chance to go up and, and meet him, and uh, I was already thinking about doing a master's in public health, and that solidified it. So I took my fourth year of medical school and did a master's in public health. I went to Hopkins and did that, and so um, finished with both my MD and, and MPH, but decided that I wanted to go ahead, even though uh, I really was excited about this notion of public health, wanted to go ahead and get the full clinical training, and so went and did my pediatric residency at um, the Children's Hospital in Washington, D.C., and did that. Um, but when I came out, I figured I had spent three years getting practical clinical training, now let me go somewhere where I could get practical public health training. And I had heard about the EIS program when I was at Hopkins, and so when I was starting to think about post-residency, um, 
I said, let me apply to the CIS program and came to CDC. Now, um, so you, when you came to CDC, um, what was your initial EIS assignment and what did you end up doing those first two years? Well, my first assignment was nutrition. And um, I looked at a range of things. I was a pediatrician, so I wanted something that had relevance to my background. I looked at reproductive health and uh, some of the, the child health oriented. I also looked at HIV and at AIDS. And it, when I was first coming in, uh, in that was the mid 80s, 1984, a lot of people said to stay away from HIV. And why was that? Well, uh, um, at that time, it was still very new. Um, I remember people saying, well, it's kind of this political disease and you don't want to get caught up in politics and, you know, it's probably something that's not going to be that serious, so why don't you go and do something that's going to have real public health impact? <laughs> so, um, so while I didn't look at, I, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily the highest on my list. It was one of those things that I looked at and kind of got um, dissuaded from it. Um, I went into nutrition because there was a lot of focus on undernutrition, and it had a big global focus, which was also something that I wanted to do um, in my, in part of the reason I wanted to do public health was because of the global aspect of it. So I went into nutrition, did a lot of work around malnutrition, both here in the United States, undernutrition, uh, as well as um, malnutrition globally, got a chance to do some very interesting nutrition surveys during one of the drought and, and famine assessments that CDC was involved in in West Africa. And um, you know, I had a really interesting couple of years looking at these issues of nutrition, particularly related to, to child and adolescent populations. Where'd you get the international bug? Did you have relatives or friends when you were little? That well, I, you know, a couple of things. I, one, my mother was, um, truly a global citizen, um, and she used to bring home oftentimes students who were from, particularly African students who were in the United States getting education. And so we got to meet a lot of really interesting um, young people. I also, during my growing up years, was very involved in a lot of the movements of the day. So, you know, whether it was civil rights movement, women's movement, anti-Vietnam, but also African liberation struggles that were going on at that time. So I got very interested in kind of pan-Africanism and, and some of those, uh, you know, the issues around the more global aspects of, uh, of, our, of our world and around, you know, a lot of the social change that was going on at that time. So, you know, I was very mm -hmm. interested in being able to contribute to the globe. And as an African American, I, I was very drawn to a lot of the issues around Africa. And so that was a lot of my initial um, thinking. Right after, uh, between college and medical school, I went to Africa for a summer in African, uh, Africa Crossroads, uh, a Crossroads Africa which was actually the precursor to Peace Corps. It's mm. a program that started um, just before the Peace Corps, sending young people to Africa uh, to get a real on-the-ground experience and kind of a cultural exchange, but for, for young people who maybe, well, that was before the Peace Corps, but it was, it was you know, during the summer, so it wasn't like the Peace Corps where it was a full two-year period. So that gave me an interest. It was kind of um, something that I was very interested in, and that kind of solidified a lot of my interest in the global world and having a chance that summer to actually see both the challenges but also the incredible beauty of uh, different cultures. I was in West Africa in Togo for that summer and, um, you know, just began falling in love with Africa and, um, you know, the challenges as well as the beauty of it. So moving forward, uh, 1987, you joined the Pediatric and Family Studies section. Um, in the AIDS program, um, and just so so the, just to fill in, there was after EIS, I did the uh, the PMR, the Preventive Medicine uh -huh. Residency year, and I did that 
in what was then, um, what was it called, the glo uh, Global Global International Health, Health Program in, inter International, yeah, yeah, International Health Program, IHPO, um, and did uh, a lot of work on um, childhood infectious diseases in Africa mm. in the program. Um, uh, it was the USAID, I'm blanking it, but it was, it was a, a huge program that CDC was um, administering on behalf of USAID around child, it was a child survival, child survival program. program. Yeah, right, yeah. right. Yeah. So then how did you first get involved working on AIDS? Well, um, you know, as I said, when I first came to CDC, um, you know, I kind of was discouraged uh, from working on HIV and AIDS. But during my time there, I began to realize how important HIV was, not only in this country, but also how it was going to become a much more global focus. And at the time, um, you know, CDC was doing a lot of work in, in pediatric and adolescent, age, well, particularly pediatric HIV. A lot, of, a lot of the initial work around the epidemiology of, of pediatric AIDS was beginning to start, uh, beginning at CDC. But right, also right around the time, there was kind of a nascent international focus. And so I, again, with my interest in um, things related to child health, but also with the international dimension, started becoming more interested in HIV and AIDS. At that time, uh, there wasn't another position available in international HIV, but there was one available in, in pediatric HIV. So it was a nice entry point for me as a, you know, as a pediatrician to enter that way, understanding that there would also be potentially global issues, uh, global opportunities as well. So this was around 87, 88. Um, what were some of the issues in pediatric AIDS at that time? And this is getting towards Ryan White and issues for adolescent uh, HIV. Yeah, and um, I, I'll just back up one more. Uh, at the time that I was recruited, um, at that time, Martha Rogers was the head of the pediatric uh, HIV um, work, and it was right at the time, I was entering right at the time that she was going on maternity leave. So I had three months uh, in between my, my PMR uh, and, and joining because she said, you know, there's no need to start till I get back. So I went to WHO for three months and worked, uh, at that time, because I was just coming off the child survival program, I worked with Mike Merson on, on um, diarrheal diseases. At that time, he was head of the diarrheal disease program. But it, by being there at the same time, I also got a chance to meet John Mann, get to know the people who were in the, at that time, special program on AIDS at, uh, at WHO. And I just say that because I'll come back to some of the, both Mike Merson as well as John Mann and some of the things that I did afterwards. So um, the issues that we, were, that we were involved in at that time, one was just the epidemiology of pediatric AIDS, and, and particularly I was working on the epidemiology of adolescent AIDS. Um, it was early on, early in the time, in the uh, era when adolescence was just beginning, uh, AIDS that was not perinatally transmitted was just starting to show. We didn't know a lot about the epidemiology. We didn't, we didn't have a lot of prevention programs at the time. So we were working with some of the hospitals in New York, particularly uh, Montefiore and Mount Sinai and others that were starting to, who were really at the forefront of a lot of the work on adolescent AIDS. And so we were just beginning to better define that. And then again, along uh, with the perinatal um, HIV transmission, starting to look at some of the prevention aspects using things like AZT to prevent uh, the spread of mother to child transmission and beginning to look at it in global populations as well. It was right around the time when Proje Sita in, in um, Kinshasa in, in what was then Zaire was, was uh, starting with the premise that if we could look at how HIV was transmitted 
in children as well as heterosexual transmission, we would have a jump on it for our own population. So we're really, you know, kind of using our authority for international research with the idea that it had both a benefit for the populations where we were working, but also because it was helpful as some of these same things started to evolve in our own population. So who were, uh, who were these young people that were getting AIDS, these adolescents early on in the U.S.? Well, it was, a, it was a mix. It was both um, injection drug use, but also sexual transmission. And I think we were, you know, really looking at who were the adolescents at greatest risk. Oftentimes it was disadvantaged young people, um, um, people young people who were in high prevalence areas um, and um, really trying to get a grip. The epidemiology clearly needed to be defined, but I think more than anything, what were the right prevention strategies for a population where risk and future risk is just not something that is easy to work with? You know, adolescents that have a sense of, uh, you know, omnipotence, how do you actually get across these messages, particularly around things like sexual transmission to young people uh, for whom something that may, that may, uh, that may impact them far in the future is not something that is easy to get across. Mm -hmm. So was CDC at, again looking and at- And at a time, and at a time during those periods where the, our ambivalence around sexual education in adolescence was also played very much into how do we deliver these messages and what were some of the restrictions on us as a government agency? Mm -hmm. So was CDC's role here to describe the epidemiology, to try and develop prevention activities? Both, both. Um, you know, at that time, in that, in, in that group, a lot of our focus was on the epidemiology because it was much more the research aspect of it. Um, later on, I got more involved in the programmatic aspects. Uh-huh. So, and then Ryan White with hemophiliacs, so some of these kids right. were hemophiliacs. And those, and, you know, some were hemophiliacs, um, and that's what got a lot more attention and, you know, in some ways a lot more sympathy, but the real epidemic was actually much more sexually transmitted uh, or, or related to injection drug use. Even among these adolescents? Even among the adolescents, yeah. Hmm. And of course, that was where the epidemic was spreading most rapidly uh, because the hemophiliac population, while early on took up a larger proportion of the cases, was more confined, you know, better controlled, more, um, more technologically um, able to be ameliorated where the sexual transmission was a lot tougher. So right around the same time, and, and really very early in your career, you were asked to serve as special assistant for minority HIV policy coordination. Um, and, and these were very early days, but it was becoming evident in these early days that minorities were disproportionately involved in certain risk groups of right. AIDS patients, particularly IV drug users and then their partners and children. Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of your activities as special assistant for minority HIV? Again, early on, seeing that this epidemic is disproportionately affecting African Americans, what was CDC's role here? What were you trying to create uh, in that space? Well, I think a couple of things. One, um, just to bring about awareness, because for so long in this epidemic, we talked about you know, groups at highest risk, gay men, people with hemophilia, um, injection drug users. And we never thought about the cross-section of those things and how they intersected with race. Um, so we would talk about, you know, the epidemic among gay men as if there were no African-American gay men. We talk about the epidemic in injection drug users as if drug users, all African Americans were drug users. You know, so I think, first of all, it was 
putting some language and rationality about how we talked about this epidemic and to try to put out, you know, to, to make clear that this was an epidemic that was disproportionately impacting communities of color for very clear reasons that had nothing to do with, uh, that didn't further stigmatize populations that were already stigmatized. So if, when we first started talking about it, African American communities and, and also uh, Hispanic Latino communities didn't want to be told that they were disproportionately impacted by HIV because, you know, by the way, we're already disproportionately impacted by everything else bad, don't give us this too. So I think a lot of the time early on was just both as a, making the public health community more aware of it so that we could, we could live up to our responsibility to serve populations at greatest need, but also to work with the communities themselves to get comfortable with this idea of talking about this disproportionality without it having to be about further stigmatizing so that communities themselves um, embrace that message without it having to be the government is telling you that you're bad people. So it was, a, you know, I think I probably spent as much time working to uh, build bridges with communities so that there was a sense of trust when, when CDC spoke about these issues, as well as working with the public health community to be sensitive to the language that we use. Because the way that we talk about diseases is oftentimes not very people-centered or human-centered. And I think we have, you know, I think in, in this situation, in HIV, not just in these populations, but in general, I think it helped us to learn how to talk to people about public health uh, issues in a very different way. And so I think it's one more way in which I think uh, HIV led the public health community in learning uh, about communication, communicating with, with populations. So we did that. Um, and, and I think the set, so part of it was just how do you frame this issue? How do you make clear that in fact, you know, this was something that was having a disproportionate impact? And what did that mean? But I think the next step was how did we make sure that we got resources to the communities that were disproportionately impacted so we weren't just talking about it, but we were also becoming partners with those communities so that in fact uh, resources, um, and that's both human resources, financial resources, training, building capacity to fight the epidemic was there and rooted in the communities that were at greatest risk. So you got, you early on, went to the communities. Who did you go to? Give us some examples. Who were these community leaders? Was it churches? Was it? Um, well, it was, you know, it was a, it was a wide array, um, churches as well as um, civic organizations, um, existing ones, but also increasingly new community-based organizations. And so there was, at that time, um, increasing numbers of community-based organizations that had gotten resources uh, from their own state and local health departments or, in fact, had, had um, put together resources themselves but didn't necessarily have the level of resourcing or the level of capacity that we found in a lot of the community-based organizations in the gay community, for instance. And so, you know, we had partners to work with um, that represented a wide cross-section of um, minority communities, but there, but um, the resources had not had not really flowed to those communities in proportionate to the need. Okay. And what might what were those community organizations doing other than health? What what's an example of the types of activities that they Sponsored and yeah, interest. You know, it was a, it was such an interesting cross section of programs. So, you know, as an example, um, barber and beauty shops. That's where a lot of people in in um, African American communities get their information. You know, you go and spend a day with in the in a barber shop, and you hear people talking about all sort of topics. So, you know, there was a lot of you know there were several organizations that actually built capacity within barbers and beauticians to talk about HIV and AIDS. 
Um, you know, I wouldn't have necessarily thought about it. I should have, since I, um, my <laughs> father <laughs> had, uh, um, owned the barber and beauty supply store, and I know how barbers and beauticians talk about everything. Uh, but, it, you know, it was ingenious. Church, church groups, um, you know, a lot of churches uh, were incredibly important because, again, churches serve such an important community function and because, uh, again, of the issues that we deal with with HIV around sex, including same-sex behavior, drug use, things that aren't oftentimes talked about in churches, but churches play such an important um, normalizing social, social role in communities. So when we were able to get churches to start talking openly and honestly about these issues in ways that you know they probably never imagined they would they had such a huge the power was was huge um, sororities and fraternities that also play you know uh, a large social role uh, so you know it was across the board a whole array of different kinds of organizations that knew better than we did how to talk to the communities at risk uh, you know the Theater and drama was another, you know, organizations that use street theater or other ways of engaging people and bringing people in. So, you know, a, a very diverse and very innovative ways of approaching and, and reaching people where they were. That is fascinating. Um, so we can talk a little bit this now, a little bit later, but you continue to work with and can I sorry can I just go back one one of the things that I thought that that to me it, um, was a real success story out of all of that is that you know we teamed up with uh, partners in the minority communities to work with Congress and particularly the Congressional Black Caucus to get past um, legislation around directly funding community-based organizations, minority community-based organizations. And it's the first time, as far as I know, that CDC kind of broke the mold of funding through state health departments to fund community-based organizations directly. And I think it really shifted the paradigm in so many ways because I think it helped to build some bridges and build some trust that had not been there before um, and, you know, with the backdrop of things like the Tuskegee um, um, experiment and what have you, this, this mistrust of the government and public health service and CDC because of things where, like Tuskegee, where, and, and HIV being a sexually transmitted disease, it carried some of that same sort of sense of mistrust. And so, you know, I think it can't be underestimated how big a deal it was for us to start funding community-based organizations directly and building that kind of direct communication and trust that just hadn't been there and might not have been there otherwise. And I think it, you know, went a long way to building a different kind of relationship, but also to getting money more directly to the kinds of service providers I talked about that really knew how to work with their communities in a very different way. And so I think, it, you know, to me, it was one of the real hallmarks of uh, how we learned to do things differently in the HIV epidemic because we needed to, and, you know, um, invention is the, what is it? Um, necessity. necessity. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Mother is the, <laughs> the invention is the necessity, what, the mother of whatever the, the phrase is. Um, so, I know that that was not smooth sailing. Um, state and local health department departments probably didn't all embrace that. Didn't uh, as that was their bailiwick right. to to work with their local communities and do public health. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? I, I I know there must have been a need for a lot of training as these community organizations may not have had the health expertise right. needed. Right. How? Tell us a little bit about your experience with trying to facilitate that to be functional. Well, yeah, I think, you know, what we wanted to do was to be able to more rapidly get resources into communities, not have, you know, what might be considered one extra layer, one extra step, but at the same time not break down what should be um, 
and an important connection between state and local health departments and their, you know, their populations, their constituencies. So we, you know, we tried to build in uh, capacity building grants and other things, and then the the um, community planning, which became a hallmark of how we funded organizations involve states and local health departments as well. So communities had to work with their state and local health departments to actually develop a plan, and it was using that plan that we did funding. So we really tried, even though we were doing the direct funding, to bring state and local health departments into it. We did a lot of work with um, ASTO and NACHO and, and you know state and local health um, organizations so that we didn't keep them out of it, but we really tried to figure out how do we make sure that this whole system works closely together, um, but also realizing that in many places, the restrictions on state and local health departments oftentimes were greater than the restrictions on the federal agency. So if you happen to be in an incredibly conservative state and you wanted to develop prevention programs that talked honestly and openly about sex or drugs, you might have better luck with the feds that had, you know, our overall federal system versus your state health department that might be governed by an incredibly conservative. So we actually did an interesting dance because oftentimes some of those very same states were happy that we were funding because they couldn't fund some of the mm. same things that we did. So we tried to work work it in a way that didn't uh, that that actually helped to make the system better for the end result that we wanted, which was getting resources to organizations that could do good job, you know, do a good job of, of prevention work and not doing it in a way that cut people out, but work with each other strategically. Did it work? The, um, there was a lot of progress. The epidemic continued to rage in minority populations. What do you think worked best, and what were some of the, the challenges to reaching that population? Well, I think the challenges are the challenges of um, you know, racial and, and economic inequity in our country overall, and HIV is just one more um, example of that. And so it's not surprising that overnight we weren't able to change um, the disproportionate impact on communities of color any more than we can some of the other public health challenges because it's, you know, it, it, HIV is just a metaphor for, you know, society broad, in a broader sense, if you will. You know, that said, I think that a lot of the programs that, um, you know, I think a lot of success in programs related to reducing spread among injection drug users, particularly programs that were able to incorporate things like um, needle and syringe exchange programs, um, drug treatment programs, um, and, you know. So I think we saw a lot, a lot of um, declines. I think um, in we we saw a lot of declines in um, sexual transmission in some populations but not so much in others. We know that in young gay men, um, that's continued to be young gay men of color, that has continued to be a population that's been harder to access, partly, uh, uh, again, because it's not only minority status, but it's also um, you know, being gay in communities that often don't accept um, same-sex um, orientation. And so, you know, I think where we saw the greatest overall stigma, that's where we saw the greatest challenges in prevention efforts. And to the extent that we could work on some of these issues of stigma and vulnerability, I think we were more successful in, in prevention efforts. Mm -hmm. So it's uneven. Mm -hmm. And I think in the states where um, people were more punitive or um, where stigma was greatest and where funding cuts you know, have happened. And, you know, we've seen um, funding cuts, uh, funding be very, um, uh, very episodic. And, and, and I think our prevention funding has been less protected than our treatment funding. 
And so, you know, I think prevention efforts have been more or less successful when we've been able to have consistent funding along with all the rest. Very soon thereafter, you were actually moved into the position as chief of the International Activity Branch in the recently created Division of HIV AIDS Prevention. So in some ways during this period, you were sort of working on everything, adolescent, minority, and international. Um, but these were important uh, times for CDC internationally, mm -hmm. and they were uh, expanding their, their presence, doing research and program implementation. Um, so there was so much going on in the field um, that CDC created this international activity particularly. Can you talk a little bit about what your role was here? There were, I know there were three sites internationally. So when I took over um, that role from Bill Hayward, when he went out to um, Kinshasa uh, to, to head Proje Sita in, 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 in Kinshasa, then Zaire, um, we had already opened the project in, in um, Kinshasa. And we then opened um, the one in Abidjan, Proje Retro C, and then uh, the Thai research project. So we then had the three, the component, the the, the um, three different um, activities, and each one was kind of formed for a slightly different reason. So um, Proje Sita was was formed at the time when we didn't know as much about perinatal transmission or heterosexual transmission, so that was more or less the research portfolio there. Um, RetroC was, op was started when um, HIV-2 was first being um, reported in West Africa, and so we w wanted a West African site. We didn't know whether HIV-2 was going to be a huge problem, whether it was going to be very different than HIV-1, but, you know, that was the basis for, for starting the project in, in um, Abidjan. And then Thailand was because they had the huge injection drug use population, and so to understand that better. Uh, so all of the projects, as I mentioned before, you know, we kind of broadly used this authority to do research that had kind of a bi-directional um, purpose to it. So yes, it, would, it helped globally, but because our mandate was a domestic mandate, we were able to do the research because it also had important um, kind of precursor information or you know, leading edge information about things that we thought could become a problem in the United States as well. So that's what those you know, three projects in general were for, but those continued to evolve over time and um, the research continued evolved as it went on. Um, they became sites for vaccine research and other kind of research, as well as uh, prevention research. Um, and then, you know, ultimately became precursors for a much broader, bigger global program that um, was the forerunner for PEPFAR. How, what was the atmosphere? So this must have been, um the first George H.W. Bush era, I think. Um, was there um, support for CDC doing funding and doing these international activities? Did you need, to, were some of your responsibilities to, to promote these activities? Did you need to go to Washington or how? How did, how did that come about in terms of CDC's expanding mandate? Well, it was, um, it was a bit challenging because it probably threatened, to a certain extent, um, international agencies like USAID and others that, that had the real international role. And that's why, you know, I keep going back to this, our justification was not that we were setting up international sites to be competitive with our real international agency. Our justification was that it would help the American people. So we had to keep coming back to that justification. Um, and it, you know, it's hard to say, you know, 
we're just doing this for Americans. We don't really care about you, you people that we're doing this research with. Uh, so, you know, I think it was a bit of a double um, role because to justify it, we had to talk about why this would help the American people. For instance, in Abidjan, um, when we were very concerned about whether or not HIV-2 would get in the blood system here in this country, that was a big part of what we said that was our justification. We need to know more about HIV-2 so it wouldn't become a threat here in this country. Uh, so, you know, it was always that dual okay. mission that we had to talk about before we got our, our um, authority expanded. And so that was one of the other things that I worked on was ultimately getting our authority expanded so that it wasn't just what was the benefit to Americans, it was the fact that we also felt that there was an important reason why CDC with its global reach uh, was involved in helping those countries for their own sake, not just because of the benefit to America. But we did have to work on getting that expanded. What did that involve? What is, what, what's involved in expanding an, an agency like CDC's Authority. Well, at that time, um, we did a lot of work with the AIDS, the office of um, the the AIDS our office, the office of in Washington. Yeah, we're, I'm forgetting its proper name. We always, uh, but the AIDS office uh, that was uh, you know out of the the White House. We had to do a lot of work uh, then. Sandy Thurman was the the AIDS czarina, uh -huh. uh, and we did a lot of work on how how could we expand this mandate. Um, so you did know, that, that did not need, need legislative uh, work? It was done through the executive? I work? think there, it, it, no, it didn't, mm, I'm actually forgetting now whether, I think it was mainly um, executive office okay. work. But I know we did have to do some uh, work on the authorizing language as well. To okay. A, to allow it. I, I'm forgetting now all the details, but I know yeah. we did have to do some work on, on um, actual legislative authorizing language to be able to expand that uh, some. What and it was also challenging because we had other um, of our sister agencies within the public health service that were also a little um, con concerned why was CDC able to do this and they weren't able to do this. So there was, you know, it, it was uh, a time of a little bit of um, contention around our expanding international role. Mm -hmm. What about our own OD at CDC? Were they supportive? Yeah, there was a lot of support. Yeah, it, it, uh, but, it, you know, again, I think there was a lot of support, and it depended on, you know, exactly what point in time, whether this was more because of a, a fear and a concern about some of these issues coming to our population and us being able to get a jump on that. But we did have, you know, we, I remember having a, a lot of support overall. Um, one of the things that I did um, while I was uh, head, heading that group, I took a trip with then Secretary Sullivan and we visited the Abidjan project. Um, hmm. I did a trip with, um, then Vice President Quayle, um, we, who we also went to the Abidjan project. Um, and so, you know, there mm. was a fair amount of support throughout um, the administration, throughout HHS at the time for the work that we were doing there. And a fair, so it was a fair source of pride, actually. So still very early in your career, you were really, um operating at a high level did did you enjoy it was it was it was it scary getting involved in such high level at at, at this early phase in your career or i you know i i um yeah you know, there were times when i was intimidated i still remember when secretary sullivan um i, I think we had already done the first trip with the secretary, and at that time we did, it was the secretary and the then USAID administrator, Ron Roskins. We did this one trip, and then he asked me to come with him to brief the vice president for his trip. And, you know, it's like, okay, I'm gonna go 
briefed the vice president. And um, I must have done well because the next day they invited me to go on the trip. So uh, you passed. Yeah, so I must I must have passed. But you know, it was at a time when I probably knew as much about international HIV as as you know most people. So I guess I had become somewhat of an authority on it. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know, I, I guess I've always thought less about um, this being me and more this is an issue that I think is incredibly important. And so, you know, uh, for me, thinking about the issue and not about me probably helped me in those situations that this was really about something. You know, I had seen yeah. people dying. I, yes. you know, I knew what we could do. I knew yes. why this was important. And so that, I think, was utmost and kind of foremost in my mind. You, fast forwarding, but not even that forward, um, became the director of the National Center for HIV, STD, and TB Prevention in, in the years 1995 to 2001. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the thinking that led to this mm -hmm. center level that would include AIDS as well as STD and TB prevention, how you wound up in that position mm -hmm. and... So, um, you know, after I was the head of the, um, the, the International HIV Research Group, I then went to USAID for a couple years and I headed their, um, their AIDS program. And, uh, you know, it was very interesting because at that time we were spending about $250 million on, on AIDS for, through USAID, which was the largest program at that time. Um, and you know now we're spending you know in the billions, and so it was very it was very interesting to to be there um, when the administration changed and David Satcher came on as CDC director. Uh, Gary Noble was stepping down from his job as the head of the CDC Washington office. I was already in Washington. David Satcher asked me to come back to CDC. I was on loan to USAID. He asked me to come back to head the CDC Washington office. And, um, you know, that I was this, uh, the associate director um, for, for, um, for, for legislative, uh, I forget the title, but I guess it's, it's anyway, it was associate director. Um, that was right at the time when David Satcher came on, he started thinking about how important HIV was and the fact that it was kind of dispersed throughout CDC. And I was part of a lot of those discussions because I was an associate director and I sat in on you know, the director's um, meetings. And as he was starting to think about that and the fact that I was, um, I wasn't at that time managing a, a large group. I had all the HIV background. It seemed like a natural to kind of pull me back in, if you will, from my my um, role in Washington, to to come and head the organization of that center. And you know, that was not an easy move because resources were AIDS resources at that time were the fastest growing resources within CDC. Different parts of CDC, you know, had their budgets. So the idea of pulling those budgets and forming one center was not easy. And I think because I wasn't involved at that point in one of the, you know, kind of line management roles, but had a overall um, understanding of it, I think he thought I would be kind of a neutral broker. And so, as opposed to taking one of the people who mm -hmm. were heading one of the AIDS programs. So I was pulled back in, um, and I think it then became, kind of was a natural for me to, to uh, move into the permanent role. But, you know, there was an open competition, and um, um, I think it was the first time in any job at CDC that I actually went through an actual interview. Uh, so it was, um, and I think it was a bit, I don't know, controversial, but because I hadn't been one of the leaders of one of the AIDS programs and I was still relatively um, 
early in my career. I think at that time I'd been at CDC um, maybe 13, 14 years or so. Um, you know, I think to become a center director, it, you know, I think it probably was a bit controversial, but. Uh, so um, what did that mean? What, what, what were the implications of putting AIDS, TB, and uh, STDs together? What did you need to do to gear up for that? Um, and what were some of the strategies, especially with respect to HIV, that were in the, in the thinking in creating this center? Well, I think, you know, the, the idea really was to have better coordination across the different um, uh, centers that had been involved in, in HIV, and also to have HIV more closely linked with the you know, associated areas of STDs. We know that STD prevention is a huge, uh, STD, STD treatment is huge for HIV prevention, but the programs um, were not joined up together uh, and that there would be a lot of you know, potential good synergies, better integrating those programs. Tuberculosis, obviously the, the um, most prevalent opportunistic infection um, in, um, with, with HIV also had, had its own separate systems and, and you know, there was just a lot of thought that by having them more closely linked, mm -hmm. there could be better cross-program coordination, better looking at a much more integrated approach, and um, that it, you know that it would have, you know, really add value to what we did in HIV overall. You know, I think it was it, it was a challenge. I think it, um, you know. STD and HIV probably fit closer together in some ways than TB did. Uh, on the other hand, I think having all of them together, there was a much better, at least communication uh, across the three programs. And in some cases, I think, you know, more deliberate program integration and collaboration. So this is a stage where, um, antiretroviral treatment was becoming much more widespread um, in this country. And um, can you talk a little bit about the, um, the balance between the treatment and prevention approaches mm -hmm. to HIV uh, during that, that phase as, as you remember it? Well, I think there was always uh, a challenge as there always is between tr treatment and prevention. Um, I think there's always a stronger call for treatment. It is the more visible, it's the more obvious when you're sick. Uh, having something that makes you feel better and something that makes an impact on your life is a lot easier. It's a, it's a, it's a more, it just is a more visible um, need than prevention. Prevention is a lot harder to demonstrate its impact. You know, the, as I always call prevention the quintessential non-event. You know, it's hard for people to be as passionate about something that doesn't happen than um, they are about something that they see in front of their eyes. And I think because for so long HIV had been seen as a, quote, death sentence, the idea that we could have this huge impact by treating people with something that was finally seen to be incredibly effective um, was very compelling. And so, and I think that in general, um, prevention is always given less priority. But I think particularly with HIV, because prevention meant talking about sex, talking about drugs, and you know, issues that we don't feel as comfortable with and that we get tied up in knots around meant that this was a particular prevention challenge because of all of the ways in which we think about sex and drugs, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think that prevention, HIV prevention, has never gotten the kind of support or the kind of, um, not just financial support, but the kind of, um, belief in it and, and um, willing to be consistent around it because prevention isn't something that you do once 
and you know the, the the issue is is fixed it's something that you have to do consistently um, we may do adolescent education for one generation and then you know say we fix that and move on you've got to think about each cohort and how do we how are we consistent with with our prevention activities so i just feel like you know one of the biggest challenges is that prevention particularly with hiv has never gotten the kind of consistent support uh, to be able to have the impact that i think it can and i think once treatment came along and particularly uh, once the impact of treatment on viral loads and the idea that treatment, that, pre that treatment could be prevention, it took the eye, you know, kind of the, the focus off of uh, primary behavioral prevention, which I still think is incredibly important and necessary. Do you think CDC got it right uh, when you look back on, on those days yourself in a leadership role and others? Um, do you think? Do you think they got it right in terms of the balance? Uh... You know, um, I think that CDC tried to get it right. I think that CDC um, left to its own devices probably um, got it right, you know, whatever, 75, 85% of the time. I think we started off with some things that were counterproductive, just the way that we talked about the populations at risk, you know, by um, using nationalities and, you know, I, yeah, there are whole ways in which the way that, that CDC began talking about, you know, the, the four H's, Haitians and hemophiliacs and what? what <laughs> Homosexuals. Uh, Homosexuals and I guess three H's. Yeah. But, you know, I think we didn't start out um, necessarily in the right way in how we talked about HIV and some of the, you know, maybe if you, hysteria, what have you. But I think we got it right. I think that CDC worked hard on, you know, uh, how do we talk about the epidemic? How do we think about prevention? How do we take this out of a moral, uh, moralizing and really look at this from a public health standpoint. And so I think CDC did an incredible job as an agency, which isn't, hard, which isn't easy for an agency to be self-critical and really uh, go through the work that it needs to go through. But I think there were some incredible leaders throughout the HIV epidemic that learned as well along the way and then I think took the, the agency on an on a important journey that I think got it to the right place. That said, I think that with different it, administrations, um, with different co um, legislative bodies, you know, we have sometimes been hampered in what we can and cannot do. Um, I can remember having um, a 48 hours where condoms were on this website, then they had to be taken off, then they were put back on again. I, you know, and so I think there are things like that that, that um, the ability, again, to talk about um, a sexually transmitted disease that also is transmitted by injection drug use. It's funny that actually in some ways injection drug use became less of a challenge to talk about than, than sexual transmission. And so I think that our overall national um, ambivalence about being honest and open about sex and sexuality has always made it very hard to do the job that I think CDC needs to do um, to continue on its efforts in prevention. You had a lot of responsibilities. Who, who did you go to when you needed a shoulder or a hand or just somebody to listen to you? Were there peers at CDC did you, that you could talk about things with? I think so. I mean, I think um, in general, uh, you know, coming to CDC at the time and work on HIV when I did, I think there was a real esprit de corps. Um, you know, we, we talked among ourselves a lot about some of the challenges and the difficulties. Um, and so I, I really do feel that, you know, I was fortunate to have people like a Jim Curran, for instance, who, you know, um, as I used to laugh and call him my longest running supervisor ever, um, you know, for a, probably a space of 10 plus years, you know, Jim uh, 
was my supervisor in all the different roles, including when I went off to USAID. He was my supervisor of record when I was um, on loan to, CD, uh, to, to USAID. And so, you know, Jim always stands out as one of these people who, without him, I'm not sure, um, a lot of us would have been sane at the at the end of this. He was, you know, he had a I think um, a strong moral compass. He really tried to do the right thing, um, learned a lot along the way, but was always very supportive. You know, David Satcher was great. When I was the center director, um, I. <laughs> um, we were always the center that gave him the most trouble, and we, you know there was always some challenge going on. And but he, no matter what, and there were times where I made mistakes, um, for sure, um, getting out in front of CDC sometimes on issues, what have you. But he always stood behind me, and the, and and my team. And sometimes it wasn't necessarily me. Uh, you know there were couple of my colleagues who were um, real strong around some of the issues around HIV, uh, around injection drug use, for instance, and got out there sometimes in front of the agency. But, but um, you know, he was always good about backing us up and then doing whatever he needed to do uh, on the political side, but, all, but never, if we were doing things out of our commitment to public health, did he ever make us feel bad about doing things that were in the best interest of the people we served. Um, you know, so, I, you know, I could, I could go on. Um, Bill Fage, even though he had already left, um, continued to be a, a strong uh, voice and support that um, we could lean on. My, my, uh, when I was center director, my fellow center directors, you know, we, we all had our challenges. It wasn't all HIV, but we were all going through difficult times for diff you know, and, and had different, different leadership challenges. But it's, you know, I guess it's, it's why I stayed at CDC so long, because I think it is a community of people who um, ultimately, and you know, I think it's changed as all organizations change as they get larger, larger. But I think at the time when I was there, throughout most of my career, there was always such a strong, supportive network of people who were not only colleagues but became great friends. We saw our, you know, people's children grow up over, you know, a couple of decades, and we supported each other. And I think that was incredibly important. You went on to do some very, very uh, distinguished things after CDC. Um, As opposed to when I was at CDC. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you worked at uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as director of HIV, TB, and reproductive health, and then CARE USA. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about, about some important themes, whether it's AIDS or work with minorities or supporting women that that stand out in those in those positions. Well, um, you know, I, I uh, went to the Gates Foundation, and in, in fact, my last uh, two years of CDC, I think, were served at the Gates Foundation. So I transitioned. I, I was on loan, served out the rest of my 20 years at CDC for, that overlapped with my first two years at, at the Gates Foundation. Then I. Um, quote, retired and then became a full Gates person. And, you know, it was Bill Fage who was actually the person who kind of got me um, to thinking about the Gates Foundation. He had gone out there to start setting up their global health program. Um, Gates started out with, with the library program, and then they decided that global health was going to be a huge priority. Bill Fage went out there and helped them to really conceptualize mm -hmm. that program. And he started talking to me about, um, they, they said within their global health program that HIV, they wanted to put a real priority on HIV, and they really wanted to put a priority on HIV prevention globally. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Bill started talking to me about it, and, you know, I was initially started helping him to recruit um, somebody for one of the positions they were thinking about, and then ultimately they wanted somebody to come and head it. Uh, he talked to me about about that. I said, I'm not leaving CDC, and I would never move out to Seattle, of all places, of course. Uh, never say never. Next thing, I started talking, and it kind of started making sense. So I went out there, and it was exciting to be there because, again, that was at kind of the early days of the Gates Foundation. And so, again, to be part of 
uh, something new, something that was being created. And I think I was able to take a lot of what I had um, learned at CDC, but, you know, looking at it from a different lens, the lens of a private foundation, and particularly a private foundation um, based on the experience of two business people, Bill and, and Melinda Gates. And so I learned a lot of, about intersecting with the world of business and how, you know, having always served a career in the government, really learning a whole different arena. And so it was fascinating to me, you know, to, to learn a little bit about the way business people think about programs and program um, uh, impact and how you think about metrics and, you know, it very differently than I think we often and with a different level of, of rigor. Um, I was, it was very, interesting to be able to start some programs. We started a huge HIV prevention uh, and program in India and in Botswana um, and, you know, to be on the cutting edge of some of that. But one of the things, and this kind of comes from my um, days at CDC as, as well as at, as at Gates, which led me to care, is that you know, when we think about some of these issues like HIV prevention or any of the um, public health challenges that we deal with uh, and look at those who are most vulnerable and disproportionately impacted, so often, you know, all we have is our medical and our public health toolbox, but we know it's the broader aspects of things that are really what makes particularly the disproportionate impact in disease. And we saw that over and over in HIV. Um, and in the global arena, uh, where HIV is primarily heterosexually transmitted, the impact on women is huge. And we, you know, it's like any other sexually transmitted disease that's heterosexually transmitted, just like STDs, women are often at greatest risk because they don't necessarily, uh, just biologically, they're at greater risk. Um, in international settings particularly, but also here, women are, are often not in the best situation for negotiating safer sex. So, you know, I started to see more and more in my work that issues of inequality, be they gender inequality, poverty, um, economic, uh, lack, of, lack of economic wherewithal, lack of access to clean and safe drinking water, lack of access to adequate nutrition, all these are the kinds of things that probably have as much impact on how diseases evolve and which populations they impacted. And so throughout my work at, at um, both Gates and then increasingly at CARE, which isn't a health organization, uh, it's a global poverty organization, but, you know, if I wanted to have an impact on health, one of the best ways to do that is to have an impact on poverty and all the things that we worked on at CARE that are really about that composite of social determinants that we now talk so much more about, you know, the social determinants of health. And more and more, our lexicon in public health is, is incorporating the fact that if we don't look at some of these societal issues, then we're not gonna have the health outcomes that we want. And so, you know, I think it has led me on this path from, you know, clinical medicine to public health to then looking at root causes of poor health to which are the social determinants to now being working less on health as the primary issue that I'm focused on, but much more how do you really work in this much more comprehensive way to attack kind of the social determinants that are not just around health, but are more broadly about how do you look at um, equity and justice uh, more broadly. Do you think CDC weaves enough of that in its own um, strategy and approach? No, I, I don't think, so. I mean, I don't think so, but I don't think it's because CDC doesn't necessarily want to. I think that we're constrained by the boxes that we're funded in, by the boxes that we have the ability to work in. So, you know, CDC, t you know, at its core is a, is a federal agency that works through state and local health departments, um, which, you know, ag again, do things that are much more in the health toolkit. And so, you know, one of the things that I think more and more of this discussion around social determinants of health means that pe agencies, you know, federal, state, and local are starting to think about, so how do we interface with housing? How do we look at, you know, whether we have um, 
a focus on not just nutrition, but also agriculture, which, you know, it, it has a huge impact on nutrition. How are we looking at issues of uh, the environment and what that does to, to drinking water, a la something like Flint, Michigan. What are we looking at? How are we looking at transportation and how that impacts whether people get to their health uh, services or not? Or and, and how are we looking at just things like um, how workplace and what happens within the workplace can impact health or not health. So I mean, I think the fact that we're starting to look at at least these factors means that we can start thinking about how do we integrate? How do we integrate databases so that you're, you know, if you're in the ed education system, you're able to actually interface with what's going on in the health system. We know that education probably has a greater impact on somebody's health outcomes than health interventions themselves. So I just think it allows us to be able to start stepping back and thinking about how we actually put some of the social determinants in practice. And it means being able to look outside of our boxes a little bit, uh, the boxes that we're assigned to, if you will, and start thinking about how do we collaborate a little bit more across those silos. Well, thanks very much. Are there anything you would like to, to add? Uh, you were a part of something that's really changed the history of public health. Um, any, any final comments? No, I guess you, you know, um, you never know when you're in the midst of making history. Who would have known, um, you know, as I said, when I first came to CDC, people said, don't even pay attention to this. It's not a serious public health issue. Not, that's not everybody said that, but, but, you know, that, that was the prevailing issue. Um, so I think, you know, part of it is that everything we do in some ways um, has significance, and I think if we take every, everything that we do in our careers and um, uh, recognize that we never know when the lessons that we're learning today are going to be important for the next generation and, um, you know, having a sense of history. And that's why I think something like this oral history project is so important, because I think it is important for us to be able to look backwards and think about, you know, history, because we never know that we're making it um, when we're in the midst of it, but being able to learn those lessons so that um, we're much better prepared in the future, that we do things, you know, maybe faster and better, um, you know, I think is important, so. Thank you very much.